Welcome everyone. This is Mayor Steve Haggerty and uh, you are at the uh, police series on a conversation about policing here in Evanston. Uh, and it's a series of conversations that um, I have uh, committed to conduct with the community, both to further educate myself, but everyone that is watching and people in our community. I think it's important as we're having a national conversation about policing that we all have a foundation which we're, we're working upon. Um, and so last week's was our first in the series and that was on the police training here in Evanston. Today's topic is gonna to be on the Evanston Police Department budget. Uh, and then next week we will uh, be having a conversation about the collaboration and coordination that exists between uh, Evanston Police Department and Northwestern's Police Department, as well as our schools, District uh, 202 and District 65 in the resource officers, which is a topic uh, that many uh, folks want to discuss. Uh, and that will be next Monday on July 20th. And then on Monday, July 27th, we will have a discussion about use of force and body cameras here in Evanston. And then on August 3rd, we will have a discussion about uh, the complaint process. Um, and then, as I mentioned at the last session, uh, I'm taking suggestions from people. If you have other topics that you want to discuss, uh, I will set up additional uh, forums for those. Um, so one uh, topic uh, that I've been thinking about, and we haven't put it on the agenda specifically yet, is the type of complaints that the police department responds to. I think people really want to have an understanding of that, Chief Cook. Uh, because you guys respond to thousands of complaints a year and I think it would be good. Uh, and I know there's also a conversation that folks want to have about um, the militarization of, of police in terms of the equipment that you use, the uniforms and all of that. So that may be another one as well. Uh, but today's topic again is on the budget. Uh, there is a movement going on uh, all around the country and here in Evanston as well uh, called Defund the Police. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar uh, with this movement, defund the police uh, is about reducing the amount of money we spend on policing in America and taking that money and reallocating it into other uh, areas that will further support, you know, the black communities, the brown communities, and those that uh, are over policed uh, because of. Um, uh, crime in those areas and, and how do we lift people up and um, and in Evanston we're pretty committed to trying to do that uh, there's never enough resources uh, but the efforts we're trying to make in terms of investments into housing and affordable housing here uh, into uh, workforce development into um, other areas like that through the reparations fund um, is uh, something we'll continue to be committed to uh, but there is this this idea that we spend a lot of money on police and how do we allocate that um, elsewhere. Um, so what I would like to do just on that topic is uh, we have with us uh, three guests today. Uh, one is Andrew Papakristos, who is a sociology professor at Northwestern University. So thanks for joining us, Professor. Uh, we have Chief Cook. Uh, and then we have uh, Lou Gerdes, and Lou is the budget director for the Evanston Police Department. So I really want to see us get into the budget in this conversation. We've got lots of questions uh, from residents that have already come in. Uh, this is being shown live on Channel 16 here in Evanston, the local TV station, as well as on Facebook Live. So if you're on Facebook Live and you have additional questions, uh, we have city staff monitoring that. They are sending me those questions in the chat function. Um, or if you just have a, a real strong opinion, put that in there in terms of where you think we could reduce expenditures as we go through the budget with the police, uh, where you think we could reduce expenditures. I will tell you this, um, we are in the midst of a pandemic, as everyone knows. Our city budget is short right now for 2020, at least $12 million, according to the last projection by the city manager. Um, we are... Um, defunding, so to speak, a lot of different things here in the city where we have to reduce the amount of expenses. Um, I, uh, I don't mean to be flipped with saying defunding because that's not what, again, people are talking about when they talk about defund the police. Um, but I do want everyone to understand we have significant deficits here because families are suffering, businesses are suffering, and as a result, governments are suffering. 
and we generate revenue, a lot of revenue off of um, a vibrancy of a city and the businesses that are in those cities and that has suffered because of the pandemic. Um, so first, let, let me go to you, Professor, and just ask if you would, um, you know, elaborate a little more on defunding in defunding the police. Yes, uh, thanks for having me. Happy also as an Evanstonian, I'm glad to uh, to be a part of this conversation. And uh, you know, broadly, the defund movement it, its roots are actually quite old, going back to uh, movements around from Angela Davis to Ruth Wilson Gilmore in the '60s. Uh, and there's also tied to abolition of prisons and police dating back a long way. And there are kind of two uh, related elements, one of which, of course, is, you know, how do we deal with the white supremacist roots and racist roots of, of modern policing and historical policing? And the, the one around the phrase defunding, of course, goes to, you know, how police function and budgets have just grown essentially since the 1960s where police were, uh, you know, still, again, working on containing or controlling the neighborhoods and populations to now providing services that range from mental health to uh, social work to dealing with all these things and budgets have just expanded. And it was really in this mo moment in the 60s where police started to become present in schools, where they had juvenile units and gang units and uh, other sorts of units. And really the, the question around defunding is that these budgets have gotten larger and larger and larger over time. Even, by the way, as crime has gone down, budgets have gone up. And so we've never really re-shifted re uh, fundings even as crime kind of went down. Um, but there are these issues of the, the sorts of things that police are responding to that have grown increasingly large over the last 50 years, which includes the lots of things that cost a lot of money, which the police were not originally doing and have since done. Crisis intervention, dealing with homelessness, sex work, substance abuse, uh, safety in school, safety at other sorts of non-emergency events. And sort of when we're at this moment of talking about defunding the police, a lot of it really starts with this question, uh, which is a very sociological question of, you know, what do we want the police to be in contemporary society? How do we deal with past sort of harms and wrongs? And what sorts of things might be better served outside of police functions? Uh, and then briefly, there are sorts of um, different police and safety initiatives uh, it, uh, around the country and the globe that have been trying some of these things for quite some time or even long time. So can we, for example, take out responses to homelessness or sex work outside of the police and get trained social workers or crisis interventionists in those spaces? And even within the space of schools, or in the space of, say, gun violence, we're starting to see other ways in different places more or less effective that can remove some of the, both the burden from budgets from police, but also making sure some of the first responders to those situations uh, are not necessarily an armed police officer, but professionals that may have more specific training, say, around intimate partner violence or substance abuse uh, as sort of one of the large um, areas that often get parts of police functions, right? So understanding what people are asking the police to do, what we're funding the police to do, and taking a moment to decide as a, as a city or as a town, which of those things we think, um, you know, might be better served elsewhere. And as you said, Mayor, you know, this is coming, of course, uh, amidst many other conversations around funding and use of funding. Uh, but, you know, historically, the real trend with police has been having increased responsibilities and increased budgets almost uniformly across this country since the, since the mid 1960s. Part of it from state budgets and of course part of it being um, uh, also supplanted by uh, federal grants and other initiatives that police departments often seek to keep their budgets where they need to be. Great, Th thank you. I think that's a great found foundation. Uh, and I think two key concepts, one defunding has been around for a long time. Uh, even though for many of us, it's, it's a new term that, that we're hearing. Um, and two, crime has been going down and yet police budgets have been going up. And that's something that I've noticed when I became the mayor and I would be in these meetings uh, with the city manager and I was always scratching my head about that. Um, but as you say, we've asked of the police more and more uh, responsibilities that we've given them, but we've also got a lot of uh, other items that are coming into the police budget. So. Um, with that, um, I had asked the police to also uh, present some material. So as we're talking about numbers today, you could actually see those numbers. So I think Patrick, 
uh, Degnan, who's helping behind the scenes facilitate this, will be will be able to actually put some numbers up here on the screen so you at home uh, can actually see the numbers. But I'd like to ask um, Gary, um, uh, excuse me, Lou Gertis, to um, go through uh, the budget. And let's just talk about the budget. I've gotten a lot of emails, uh, Lou, and people will say, uh, hey, Mayor, it's outrageous that we spend $54 million a year on policing here in Evanston. Um, and we have lots of different costs. So I'd like you to talk about what are the operating costs, the annual operating costs for our police, and then um, what are the other costs that we have, which are really pension-related costs for officers who have retired or others that may not be retired, but we're putting significant amounts of money into the pension. I'll let you take it away, Gary, Lou. Okay, thank you, Mayor Haggerty. Uh, yes, the police department has put together a, a quick presentation on the police department budget, and it should be on your screens right now. And it's the distribution of police department expenditures by category. And we brought, boil it down to a department level uh, categorization of the various costs. Um, we've, conclude, we've included 2019 budget and actuals for historical context. Hey, Lou, can I just uh, have you pause for one second? I don't know if uh, others are the same. I, I'm not seeing the numbers okay. on the uh, on the share screen for us. Give me uh, one second, Mayor. I'll, I'll pull it up in just one second. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. So the voice you all just heard that you don't see on your screen is Patrick Degnan, who is our public information officer here with the city, who's really i think does it he and his team do a terrific job getting information out to the public so now we've now we've got it up on the screen okay. Liz, so i'll let you take it away okay so yes yeah, so, so now we have the distribution of department expenditures by category and and as i mentioned we we have 2019 and uh budget and actuals for historical context and we're going to go through the 2020 budget and we've broken it down by three main categories for simplicity and those are personnel costs, and then services and supplies, and lastly, fleet maintenance and replacement. And these are the three main categories of the department budget. And the first thing that should stand out to everybody is that basically 94% of the police department's budget is personnel related. And the first one being just salaries, which constitutes nearly 50%. But then we have pension costs which is 27% at, at approximately $11 million. The benefits is $4.6 million, and $3 million of that is health insurance. There are payouts and then overtime. And that comes to constitute 94% of the police department's budget. What does payout, what is payouts mean? I think people understand all those, but maybe not payouts. Yes, yes, payouts are a variety of required payouts, meaning payouts to members of the force, that are required by uh, union contract or by law. And, and they could be three main categories. There's sick leave payouts, vacation payouts, and comp time payouts. Okay. And the majority of those are required by union contract. So Got it. Um, does that answer your question, sir? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, next we have services and supplies. And, and this is the next biggest category at 1.5 million. And the first one is liability insurance, and that is a transfer from the police department budget to the insurance fund in the city to cover liability expenses that occur. Uh, the next major cost is the body-worn camera program. So that's approximately $300,000 a year, uh, followed by training at $160,000 a year. Um, and what that would like to point out is that the police department has doubled its budget for training in the last five years. In 2015, the police department's budget was only approximately $77,000 for training. So it has doubled in the last five years. Uh, memberships at $116,000, uh, the main one there is for the crime lab membership for, for all the, um, what do you call it? All for the analysis of evidence. Analysis of evidence. And, and that crime lab is approximately, membership annually is approximately $100,000. Now we have next is animal shelter grants at $100,000, and, and that is part of the police department budget because the animal control is part of the police department budget. Uh, next expense is, largest expense is janitorial supplies at approximately $60,000, and that's for the maintenance of the police department building. 
And then last, we have all other services and supplies at basically half a million dollars. And that's everything else that the police uh, needs to keep the organization running. Uh, and then last is the major category is fleet maintenance and repair uh, at $900,000, which is basically all the vehicles the police needs to do its job. So that is a quick summarization of the expenditures of our department and the total expenditures are $41.1 million. All right, so let's keep on this page for a second. Um, and, uh, you know, Chief, uh, I noticed that uh, that budget, right, for 2020 is 6% above the budget for um, 2019. I did my if I did my math right, uh, it was a six percent increase. Pretty 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 significant. Um, and where we're seeing that, so if you're watching, you know, from home, you know, there's a, a big jump in salaries. All right, that's related to union contracts and agreements that are given in terms of uh, people making more. There's uh, you know a significant almost eight hundred thousand dollar uptick in pension in pension costs. And we're going to come back. I want to talk pensions a little more. So people understand those numbers as they fold into our police budget. Um, and then payouts was a big jump. I mean, payouts was, you know, $800,000 uh, increase um, there. So Chief, could you just, I mean, that's a pretty big increase, 6%. six percent. Um, could you talk to, and I know the Chief's been with us now for 18 months as our police chief, but can you talk to us about the growing uh, budgets in policing. You were the chief uh, in um, Glenwood before you were here. Um, that increase that we're seeing in budgeting as crime is going down, as the professor mentioned. Yes, sir. Well, a lot of the increase comes through uh, salary increases, which are negotiated through union negotiations. So uh, this past year, uh, the officers were given a 0% raise. Uh, they agreed to that, but they were, in exchange for that, they were given, I think, seven additional uh, comp days that they could utilize to be off, carry over, and eventually uh, get paid out at. Now, what, what happens with that type of benefit is it increases over time. So if I don't utilize my comp time days this year and I'm, I'm allowed to carry them over and then I get a, a, a raise, then that comp time money uh, increases. So that is one issue. The other issue is uh, the ever growing compounded rate of pensions. Uh, you know, if you get a pension uh, after 20 years at 50%, when you, when you reach the age of 55, uh, you get uh, you would get a 15% increase in your pension. Between 50 and 55 is no increase. But when you make 55 years of age, you get a 15% increase. And then each year after that, uh, it's a 3% raise until you uh, pass away. So it's a lifetime pension. Uh, that is a constitutional issue that has been in effect for a number of years. Uh, the money that is reflected in the police budget, uh, $11 million for pension payouts, is uh, money that the city has to pay in order to keep the pension fund south. Now, the police officers, uh, their 9% uh, of their salary is taken out of their check every day or uh, every pay period for their share of pension costs. Uh, but over the years, over uh, I can go back, I can go back 40 years now. Uh, 35 years ago, uh, the government was uh, supposed to pay down the pension costs to become zero in, in what they owe. That never happened. Uh, the legislature gave government another 30 years which we're still in now for them to come up uh, solvent with the pension fund. So those are the really big issues uh, related to costs. 
The other big ticket item in the budget that I'm really cognizant about is the uh, is the cost of police vehicles. Uh, Ellison has a lot of trucks. We have a lot of uh, the Ford Explorers, uh, fully fully equipped. You're looking at probably a forty five thousand dollar vehicle. That's with a computer, uh, a radar, and things of that nature uh, that are installed. Lights installed in a vehicle. So uh, I've been looking at an alternative vehicle that's half the cost, and I ordered five of those. And my goal is to decrease the number of police vehicles we have. Uh, the other thing that I did out in, when I was in Glenwood as a police chief was look at the purchase, the joint vehicle purchase of vehicles with another municipality. Uh, if you come past the police de uh, department at night, you'll see 20 trucks lined out in the back, just sitting there waiting for the next day. If we can cut costs in terms of what we purchase by being in partnership with another municipality, I think that is a, is a great way to go. Joint purchasing on a lot of things we could do, uh, uh, even radios, uh, we can joint purchase. There's a lot of uh, things you can do to cut this budget down. Thank, thank, thank you, Chief. And I know Kathy, who's watching, uh, appreciates that because she had some questions about the fleet maintenance and replacement and that price or that cost go, going up. Uh, she also had the question about, you know, is technology, even though it's a much smaller expense here, again, everybody should, you know, take note, you know, 94% of the expenses are personnel related expenses. So this is very labor intensive, the work that the police department does. So when we talk about defunding the police, we're talking, you have to be talking about reducing the number of, you know, police officers uh, that are there if you want to bring down the budget of the of the police. Um, and uh, and we can talk, we'll talk about that in a, in, in a bit. Um, but Kathy also asked the question about is technology um, also increasing the, the cost of policing? Um, and I can tell you, at least from my time on the city council over the last three years, you know, one of the, the big new technology expenses, but it's been something that everybody here in the community wanted, including our police department, is body worn cameras. And so that, you know, runs a little over $300,000 a year. Um, and part of that expense uh, is the storage of all of that video. That costs a lot of money to store that. Um, so Lou, can you talk a little, I wanna make sure everybody understands whether this is the complete picture of the police or whether there's other expenses anywhere out there, you know, off of this, you know, P and L so to speak um, for policing costs. I'm specifically talking about pensions. Are we showing all the pension costs right here on this spreadsheet and captured in your operating costs or there are some elsewhere? Well. Yes, sir. In terms of the cost to the city, we're representing all the costs of the city in that $1.2 million. And, and this is one of the most... I'm sorry, the one point, I'm sorry, you said one, you mean... $1.2 million. $11.2, yes. Mm -hmm. $11.2 million of pension costs. And this is one of the more complex areas of uh, government accounting. And, and I will try to explain it and, and keep it as simple as terms possible. So every year, the annual required contribution is calculated by the actuarials, and, and that is part of the annual tax levy. And, and when the money is collected, the property tax or the police and fire pension, it is credited to the general fund and, and noted in the police department budget, and, and there it is, $11.2 million. That money is then transferred to the police pension police pension fund. So it is also listed as an expense on, on the department's, as you said, P&L expenditures. At that point, the cost of the city is over. Once the money is paid to the pension fund, it, it is no longer uh, an issue for the, the city of Evanston. The police pension fund then distributes that month that those funds. Now, the police pension fund for transparency is part of the city's budget. However, the police pension fund is not owned by the city. It is overseen by the police pension board. 
It is administered as a trust by the city. However, it is not owned by the city. It's actually owned by the current former members, uh, sworn members of the police department. So I know there's a lot of confusion there about what exactly is the cost of the city. The cost of the police department to the city is $41.1 million. Do you know where, so a lot of aldermen and myself and others have gotten uh, the email from folks, the standard email, and it cites $54 million for Evanston Police. And obviously we're looking at, you know, your spreadsheet. Uh, this is all in public documents and everything else. And it's clear that the budget for 2020 is $41.1 million. Do you know where the $54 million is that, that folks are citing? Well, well, sir, I've seen three numbers. Actually, I've seen two. I haven't seen the 54. I've seen $52 million. I've seen $56 million. Uh, and maybe I'm, mis maybe I'm misstating because maybe it was 56 and I'm forgetting the number. Uh, $56 million, I believe, is coming when, when uh, uh, from part of the budget where it, it, it shows a chart. Uh, I, I think it's page 35 of the, of the 2020 budget that shows uh, a $56 million. And, and that is including the police department, the E911 fund, and the police pension. Now, so two of those things I, should not be included in the city's expenditure for 2020 for the police department. The, as we mentioned before, the $14 million for the police fund, police pension fund, is, is not city expense, it, it's expense to the police pension fund. And then the E911 fund of about a million dollars left over that, that is really cost outside the police department for emergency service, emergency E911. Uh, the police department does have a line item in its budget for its chunk, its portion of emergency services. And it also has a line item for non-emergency service, part of the service desk. So, I, yes, I, I know it's confusing. As I prefaced at the beginning, this is one of the most complicated parts of government and county is the pass-through of the pension costs. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you for that, Lou. So if we are looking at, and, and people have an interest in reducing the police budget, the real area where you're gonna reduce it is on salaries. Salaries drive then pensions, benefits, payouts, and overtime, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, and so we've got $20.2 million in salaries for 2020 uh, for our police department. Let's go on. I, I think people would really appreciate understanding the distribution of these expenses by operating unit. Is that something you or the chief could cover next? Uh, yes, sir. We have it provided a little bit further down. We have it right here. So why don't, why don't one of you walk us through uh, just this and hit the highlights so people understand. So uh, we, we have about 20 different areas of operation within the police department. I'm going to go through them very briefly. If you have questions, please let me know. The first one is police administration. And, and that is basically the chief and department-wide expenses. So. Uh, you, you see it for 2020 at, at basically 30, uh, 30%, 33% of the budget at $13 million. Well, that is including the, the pension expense, the transfer to the pension fund. Uh, it, it's covered. It's also including um, the payouts and overtime because those are distributed department wide. Um, so there's a collection of expenses there that, that cover the whole department, not just that single cost. So next we have patrol operations, which is the main area of the police department's operations. And, and that's, you know, the, 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 the cops on the beats, um, the, the shifts. And, and that is 32% of the police department budget. Can I ask, can I just stop you there for, for a second, Lou? And this is really for the, for the chief and, and uh, you know, here we are, we're looking at administration. Most of us think of administration being management, supervisors, all of that. And then we've got patrol operations. And both of these in the budget run about the same. You know, 32% of the budget is for administration and 31% of the budget is for officers that are actually on the ground. Uh, I think that would be a question that makes 
question I have. I think it'd be a question that many people have. And, and could you could you help us with that? Because oftentimes, it, yeah, I think people think like management should be a lot less than the actual folks that are the operators, so to speak. Well, it would be if that 11 million for pension costs weren't in there. The 11 million is a debt. In all but, 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 but if I understood, if I understood Lou right, personnel here factors in the pension cost for every single item, whether it's 2205, 2210, 2215, right? I, I, no, sir. It, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, a roll-up number of uh, eleven million dollars. It's paid. It's charged to twenty-two hundred five. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed that. So all the pension is charged to twenty-two hundred five. Yes, sir. Yes. Oh wow. Okay, that would be explained. Yeah. So if you if you look at that number, external of uh, what is allocated, uh, is, is administration really has a small budget. Is this a salary uh, of myself in there? I think that would be good to, good to to know. I don't know if there's a way to do that uh, so you can come back to folks and just say, hey, backing out the pension costs out of 2205, police administration really is, you know, a million and a half dollars or you know, two million dollars or something like that. And then you'd look at that and say, okay, well, the administration, if I just set pensions aside, it's 10% of the overall salary budget of 20 million. Right, yeah, that, that, that is a, you know, that, that one captures, 2205 captures all of the department-wide expense that aren't distributed to the individual business unit. Okay. So that way, it, that's why it's, this, you know, a, a larger chunk of the pie than, say, patrol operations. Because that's where we book all of the, you know, department-wide expenses um, it, it'd be a considerable accounting challenge to try and distribute it out between all the business units. Cost okay. okay. So, uh, mm -hmm, yes. mm -hmm. um, all right. What I think then, I mean, so this is just a, a summary and people can see percentage wise of the money. Can you go to the, I think you've got another slide that actually shows the number of positions that you have in each of these uh, areas. And I think that would, that may be good. I mean, again, so people that are watching, we've got $20 million that are in salaries a year. And as you're walking through the number of positions then that we have in each of these different areas, uh, can you also let us, let us know, um, you know, is the department fully staffed? And this was a question from Alderman Rainey, who's, uh, who's watching and, um, you know, and, and somebody else asked, uh, you know, can we see a breakdown of the budget by activity and units? So that's what we're, we're getting at right now. Is looking right, at. right now, we're not fully staffed, but staffing is a matter of what you would expect with service delivery. So staffing, having a proper amount of staffing to deliver services that the city expects, you know, whether it's investigative services, whether it's uh, a problem solving team, whether it's victim advocates, you know, uh, when you look at the services that we, that we serve, uh, we're not fully staffed. And uh, right now we currently have 13 positions that aren't staffed. And under the recommendations of uh, Hilliard Heights, you know, the city paid for a, uh, a study to be done by the Hilliard Heights firm and it looked at uh, how efficient we were in managing the department in terms of span of control and activities uh, within those uh, different units. And we had, uh, when I came here, we had positions, uh, for instance, an executive officer position that reported to the chief. It was a command level position, but he didn't have any employees. So, you know, having a, a, a person making $150,000 with zero span of control is inefficient. So I looked at all of the inefficiency uh, in the uh, police department and we froze two commander positions because uh, the, the, the cost didn't justify the workload. Hey, hey Chief, while you're talking, can Lou, could you make this a little larger so our audience can see some of the numbers? I know they realize they may miss some of the bottom of the spreadsheet, but just as the Chief's talking, okay. Uh, is that better? Yeah, that's. I think that's better for folks. Thank you. 
we flattened the department in terms of uh, the number of, of people uh, that we have doing the work. And we did that to be efficient in other areas of the department. For instance, when uh, we had a, a commander retire, I moved uh, out of patrol, I moved that uh, executive officer down to patrol, give him a greater span of control and be more in line with the recommendations of the Hilliard Heights uh, survey that they did. Uh, we've also had hiring freeze where we got approved to hire eight police officers, but due to budget constraints and um, in the COVID era, we have put those positions on hold. Uh, I have reorganized the police department uh, we, we experimented with a two deputy chief system uh, where it was a chief and two deputy chiefs, uh, six commanders and 20 sergeants. Uh, that was the same organizational structure that existed in 1967. I was able to go back in the annual reports to those times and look at uh, uh, how the department was structured during those particular times. And, and, and believe it or not, in 1967, uh, it was more crime than it is today. Uh, Everson had more murders than we do today. Thank God we don't have any as of now. Uh, so I knew that that structure could work, but it was a lot, it was a workload that may have been a little bit too heavy uh, for a one deputy chief. So we had one deputy chief working in operations and the other one working in support service. And we tried that for a couple of months and we decided to go back to the three deputy chief uh, positions that we had prior to COVID uh, starting. And, and uh, uh, we have frozen just about every asset we have around here to do training, uh, to make purchases of vehicles and things of that nature due to other city budget concerns. So looking, looking at the, so thank you for that chief uh, and letting people know sort of where we are now. And, and so I think the key takeaway from that is, well, we looked at the summary of costs a second ago and we had $41.1 million for a budget for 2020. We will see the budget actually come in less than 41.1, uh, uh, unless something terrible happens this year in terms of emergencies and we need the police and then you have a lot of overtime and things like that, will come in less because they were given certain positions to fill, but the chief and the interim city manager uh, ha have made adjustments and not filled. Right, well, one thing we did in order, uh, where we expect to see uh, budget reduction is uh, we shifted to a 12 hour shift with added relief, uh, when, when I say relief, or Kelly days that will allow an officer to be off an extended period of time. And, and that has been successful for us because we've only had one officer uh, be diagnosed with COVID. Uh, so having, uh, you know, when you have a 12 hour shift, you actually put more police officers on the street at any given time. So each, each shift, the day and night shift, they, they each have 17 officers uh, per shift uh, working. So we have seven, so let's just pause for a second, Chief. So I think that's an important piece of data. We have 17 officers uh, that are working on a 12 hour shift out there patrolling in Evans. Is that what you said? Yeah, those are just beat officers. That doesn't count officers in specialized units like, uh, like the neighborhood enforcement team, TAC, uh, uh, the detective bureau. All right, I want to get to those teams. I want to get to those teams in a second, so we all understand that. Yeah. Um, all right, and then just looking at because right now people have on their screen the position report as of July first, twenty twenty. There's one hundred and sixty five. Uh, excuse me, budgeted, and then um, yeah, uh, there's a hundred and fifty. Okay, FTEs right now. Uh, Fifteen vacancies, as the as the chief uh, just mentioned. Uh, that right now where they are not rushing out to fill those vacancies uh, and they're making adjustments and modifications. So 150 and out of those 150, we have 
um, 10 that are supervisors, the chief, the deputy chief, the commander, um, and then you have the sergeants and the officers, and sergeants are out in the field too, correct, chief? Yes, sir. So, so we'll include those as folks that are out in the, in the community. You've got 140 total uh, folks, but again, uh, uh, or officers, I should say, that are, that are out there. Um, again, at any given time, the chief is saying that you have 17 uh, that are um, patrolling. Is that just officers or does that include sergeants, chief, too? That just, that just includes the officer. All right, and then a couple and, of sergeants. Uh, yeah, we can have anywhere between two and four supervisors working per, per shift. Okay. And if we scroll down a little, Lou, I just want folks to understand, now we have all the civilians. So these are not uh, sworn officers, but we have another 52 folks, uh, or 52 uh, employees that work for the police department uh, that are in uh, these other positions. And uh, if you just look through those really quickly, you see 311 supervisor. Um, are other uh, 311 operators also on this list, Lou? Uh, yes, they are. They are listed as the service desk officers on. Uh, there are eight full-time 311 operators currently, and they're fully staffed. And those are 311 operators. What about the 911 operators? Uh, 911 operators are telecommunicators. Okay. 16 of those. 16, 16 911 operators. So th that's the bulk that you're seeing of the 52. And then you have, a, a, again, an animal warden. We have one animal warden for the city of Evanston. Uh, and then you have a crime analyst. You have a records manager. Uh, so could you just talk, uh, I think there's a couple records uh, folks there. Could you just talk about how, you, why do we need so many people dealing with records and, and how do they, uh, how are they used to? Well, uh, we, we have a records coordinator uh, that manages the records department and then we have four clerks uh, that work in records processing, reviewing uh, police reports, sending police reports uh, electronically back to the officers for re for correction. Uh, so that's an ongoing thing. Uh, they scanning police uh, actual uh, documents into a program called LaserFiche, which stores uh, the historical data uh, for uh, an indefinite uh, period of time. So the, the Records Bureau is a multi-functioning in terms of services that put out. They fingerprint uh, citizens that may need uh, some type of fingerprinting for employment. Uh, they fingerprint city employees. Uh, they fingerprint people that maybe want to get a liquor license. Uh, they do all of those type of things. Uh, they also manage uh, our UCR, which is our Uniform Crime Reporting System, uh, uh, whereas our our data is sent to the state, who in turn sends it to the FBI. So it's a, it's more than just records that they do. They also are responsible for uh, managing the Freedom of Information Act uh, uh, paperwork that comes through here also. Okay. Thank 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 you, Chief. Uh, let's go. I want everyone to understand the the different types of units that we have. Uh, and so could you go to that next slide that you have that has the different type of units? And real quickly, uh, Chief, if you could just uh, describe those real quick, real quickly. Uh, I'm particularly interested in the ones where you have sworn officers that are that are working and I want the public to understand what they're doing. And then I'm gonna ask uh, uh, Professor uh, Papa Christos if he'll then, uh, you know, after having heard all this and seen the different kind of units that you have, uh, just uh, share any thoughts he has uh, from, you know, working uh, and researching others around the country uh, that he could shed some light on just in terms of Evanston, like, yeah, this is pretty standard, or there's some things that we're doing here that maybe other communities aren't, or if there's others that are, uh, you know, already working on in sort of claiming the mantle of we've defunded the police, you know, what activities and changes have they made um, in their uh, in, in their offices would be helpful. 
So, Chief, I'll turn it to you right now. Yes, sir. All right. Going down to patrol operations, those are the uniformed patrolmen uh, that patrol the city uh, on a 24-hour on a basis, 365 days a year. Uh, we have a new deputy chief there, uh, Melissa Secludi. She was just recently promoted, uh, and she has four commanders under her authority uh, and 12 sergeants. Uh, and 67 police officers that patrol uh, the shift, the various shifts. Then you go into criminal investigations. Uh, you have a deputy chief there. That is Deputy Chief Aretha Barnes. Uh, she has a, a commander there, uh, 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 Commander Brian Henry. He's responsible for the overall management of, uh, of the Detective Bureau. They do follow-up investigations on a number of things. Uh, domestic violence, sex assault, general investigations, if someone was stolen from you. Uh, they're also very active. Uh, we have a very active cold case uh, unit going in that, in, that, uh, in that unit where every detective is assigned a cold case, and, and they're, they're responsible for reporting back on those cold cases uh, on a quarterly basis. And that is facilitated through our records management system uh, that they utilize. Uh, the next one is uh, uh, police records, which we just talked about. Uh, they serve uh, uh, all of these units. They are support unit. They, they, they function to serve the rest of the units in the police department with the various services that I spoke about previously. Not only records management, but four years, fingerprinting, uh, UCR, and things of that nature. Communications, uh, which is another uh, uh, support service function, uh, those are the dispatchers that dispatch the police calls in the police department. They also directly intake the 911 calls. Uh, the city is, was a little bit behind in terms of technology, uh, but the city uh, gave us the $1.5 million for us to purchase the Apex radios, which we are in a current, uh, currently uh, implementing right now. So that will put us in connection with all of our neighbors, Spokey, Wilmette, Horn Grove, Glencoe. We'll, we'll be able to to communicate with all of these different entities uh, for help if need be. The service desk, which is another support function, it is a primary function. Uh, that is where the culture of the police department is defined, in my opinion. You know, when you call in, if you get a bad flavor from one of these people, you know, you can have a, a, a bad taste in your mouth about the police department in general. So we do a lot of auditing of intake of calls just to see that uh, they're not keeping people on hold unnecessarily long and that they are routing people to the services in the police department that they need. And they have really been really good at what they do. And I'm, I'm proud of the customer service that goes on at that service desk. Uh, again, the same thing with the 311 center. That's a support function. Uh, they intake calls from all over the world uh, with people wanting to know about Evanston or wanting to reach someone within the city for a service. And that's critical that you be efficient and provide that service as quickly as possible, not having people held on and so forth. The next one is uh, the Office of Professional Standards. Uh, this is the complaint department. This is where uh, we have internal complaints uh, about officer conduct. We also uh, manage external complaints if a citizen want to call in and complain. Uh, as you know, Mayor, we are in the process of implementing uh, the Citizen Police Review Committee. Uh, that is a private entity that will be looking at how we operate in terms of disposition with cases uh, looking at how we can do things better and, and so forth. Uh, that is a critical function. Uh, we are in the era of police oversight. I welcome police oversight. Uh, and I think that uh, the program that you started is going to be really well. Uh, 
Then you get into uh, the Office of Administration. Uh, we have two people there in that unit. We have a sergeant and an administrative assistant. Uh, the sergeant in that unit is Sergeant Gil Levy. He manages all of the all of the training for the police department. Uh, he ensures that uh, officers receive the training that is mandated by the state. Every year they come out with new new training that is mandated. Uh, we also look at career development uh, through Northwestern. Uh, Evanston has always been uh, big on career development with educating people in the supervisory roles through the Center for Public Safety. Uh, last year we sent uh, six or seven uh, uh, supervisory personnel through staff and command over at Northwestern. Uh, we we'll also have uh, sent uh, officers through the Perth School at Harvard University. That's uh, the Senior Management Institute for Police. And these classes give these officers the, the skills that are critical for problem solving, looking at ethical dilemmas, and being efficient in thinking and moving the police department forward. Uh, next, we have uh, the neighborhood enforcement team. Uh, that is our gang, drug, and narcotics unit. Uh, they're tasked with the suppression of narcotics and drug activity within the city. Uh, they work in coordination with federal and state agencies. We also have a good working relationship with our neighbors, Skokie and the 24th district. Uh, so. Uh, that is a, a, a really critical uh, part of what's going on today. Violence suppression. Uh, you know, we work uh, in in conduit with the 24th district. It, when they have a killing on their side of the border, that affects us also. So we try to work in concert with them and making sure that people are safe leaving the train station and so forth. Next is our traffic uh, bureau. Uh, Everson has an award-winning traffic bureau. Uh, they win the state award every year. They either in first or second place in, in how they patrol DUIs, uh, traffic crashing. We have uh, five uh, certified accident reconstructionists. Uh, that is a very rigorous uh, 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 certification to get. Uh, our officers are in the forefront of traffic accident investigation on the traffic uh, major, major accident investigation unit, which is a multi-jurisdictional uh, traffic uh, investigation unit. The next uh, unit that uh, I really take pride in is the problem solving team. That is our community policing uh, aspect what I'm trying to do is push problem solving uh, from one unit down where it is a problem solving unit in a whole police department. Every officer that patrols the street should be working on a problem in his neighborhood. Uh, and we're in the process of completing our uh, problem solving sheet that uh, they will be able to distribute to the office Officers, uh, it'll be a quantitative and a qualitative analysis of what they doing out to solve problems in the neighborhood. Uh, and that will be in conjunction with the ward audit. Uh, and then we'll be able to just say uh, that we, we do do community policing. This is what we do and this is how we do it. We're also working on a youth uh, advisory uh, committee, community uh uh, policing unit. Uh, that unit will take youth from throughout Evanston and we'll work with them to get their perspective on what they think policing should look like. Uh, we have some very uh, intelligent youth over at Evanston High School and I think it's important that we utilize youth, find out what their opinions are and try to work with them. In the, way. the Property Bureau is the unit that takes all the recovered property, whether it's narcotics, found property, uh, money seized, and so forth. Uh, they're responsible also for tracking uh, 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 evidence through the crime lab. Evanston is very fortunate to have a private crime lab. Uh, we pay $100,000 a year for that. 
but we get uh, analysis of, of, of evidence DNA back within a couple of months, whereas in the state crime lab, it'll take you almost a year. So that's a big plus for Evanston. Uh, the animal warden is, a, is another uh, unit that we really need. They do great work uh, in this town for recovering animals that have been killed, uh, housing animals that are strayed, and that's in concert with uh, Wilmette. We also do the animal control services uh, for the city of Wilmette. And that type of partnership is what I want to build in more areas within uh, uh, the police department in order to be more cost efficient. Uh, building management, uh, I, I consider myself the primary building manager even though we have a, a officer, uh, well, not a police officer, but a gentleman uh, here that is a, a engineer and keeps this building clean, keeps it functioning. But I expect everybody in the police department to do that. Okay, so thank that's, you. that's that's briefly. Yeah, thank, thank you, Chief. I appreciate it. I think it's important for everybody to understand all of the different uh, units that the police department has. Again, some of these are resident facing like our patrol operations a traffic bureau our problem solving our problem solving team our service desk and then some of them are internal which are critical to the operations like our records uh, po police records group um criminal investigation people may not see because they're sort of working behind the scenes and and, and investigating crimes uh, and then the property bureau and others. We did have a question from Claudine and Alexandra. Does the Evanston Police Department have social workers on staff? Uh, and so can you talk about uh, talk about that, Chief, and whether there's any plans to hire more? Yes, uh, uh, Evanston Police Department was the pioneer in social services in Illinois under Chief William Logan. Uh, he developed uh, uh, community outreach, not only for victims of domestic violence, but also for troubled youth out of the juvenile bureau. And it was, we were actually doing what is known as peace circles before it was called peace circle. Uh, getting with the parents, getting with the kid and the victim and try to resolve situations uh, and have positive outcomes. Uh, I left for eight years and came back, and now the victim advocates are uh, working out of uh, uh, the health department, but they're housed here in the police department. So we still have a, a, a good working relationship uh, with the advocates. I prefer the advocates to be in the police department uh, because they're right here to deal with the domestic violence. They're right here to take the women. And, and children that may need orders of protection out. They, they do our death notifications, uh, you know, and we've had a number of those uh, under the COVID. And these, these ladies do a great job. They're professional social workers. They have all of the certifications required. Thank, thank, thank you, Chief. So right now we have how many total? Uh, two. We have two. So yes, two advocates, and just so everybody uh, that's watching, you didn't see them in their budget because they're funded out of the health department budget, because that's where they were moved. That's where they were moved to. At one time, they were in the police department, but they work very closely, obviously, with the police department. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you. Uh, I'm going to um, ask the uh, professor now to uh, to chime in. Great. Thanks. So. Um I'm going to talk really briefly about two things. One, an easy thing that's not so easy. And then the second, which I think is a way to summarize what the real sort of um, soul searching moment will have to be for the city of Evanston. On the former of the easy thing that's not so easy, part of it is figuring out which of these sorts of things uh, that you've gone through within the bu budget, you know, may be better placed elsewhere or overlap. So the records management system, the analysts, the sorts of things that might be duplicative within the city proper. Uh, I think, can you save some money there? Of course, when you're talking about the budgets. Um, I think the hard thing, uh, the, and you can do that, and, and we should do that. The hard thing, of course, is um, goes back to where we started, which is 
you know, 93% of the budget having to do with personnel means policing in general, deep, defunding the police or thinking about this really comes back to uh, the, the what Evanston and Evansonians want to have as like the ratio of uh, officers that are patrolling to residents. And, you know, back of the envelope calculation is about 530 officers per uh, one Evansonian. And, you know, that puts us on par with cities uh, like uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, San Diego, Jacksonville, Florida, Fargo, North Dakota, San Jose, um, and much, uh, you know, Chicago is about 180 officers per resident. Boston is about 255. But ultimately, that question about how many officers we have per capita is what will drive that 93% with the big asterisks around commitments made to retirement, pensions, unions, and so on. But that's actually the tough thing that has to be dealt with to the extent you want to move the budget more than that other 6%. Um, and I think one other place to start with that, of course, is, and, and I'm, I'm sure that the, the chief and, and everyone has looked at this is, you know, what are the, what are residents calling for, right? So if you were to analyze 311 and 911 calls, this last point, 311 covers everything. Well, so does 911 in most instances. And so maybe taking a look at, um, you know, where, where we're expending patrol efforts, you know, on a, on a daily basis that overlap or don't. Um, and also, you know, we, we talk about, you know, uh, Evanston and our neighbors also to the north and west, but also to the south. And so where and how we allocate those resources and can we do that in ways that are more efficiently? I think the chief named uh, many examples nationwide around Peace circles, restorative justice. There are new initiatives around neighborhood and community policing, um, all of which, you know, again, having been in some of these rooms with the chief, knowing that those are on uh, on the radar, if you will, and thinking about how maybe some of those can uh, leverage or offset what's traditionally assigned to patrol function. Um, but really, it's it that's where I think any defund conversation will have to come down to personnel and how many police we want and what we want those police to do, I think is really the question. And that's what you have to answer. You know, what, what do we want, what are they doing and what do we want them to do? And, you know, do Evanstonians want that ratio to get smaller and, and relative to our neighbors all around? So I think that's a hard question. That's a really hard question. And to, to the chief's point too, you know, we, what, was the, what was it like when crime was higher? Mm -hmm. People look at say violent crime or um, other types of crime as well. But I think that's going to be the moment that we have to come to, to really have a conversation around. Without that, the 94% of the budget that goes to personnel is going to be hard to move. Yeah. No, I think you did a great job concisely getting, getting at those uh, two points. I'm curious, uh, when it comes to, you know, what's your community standard of? How many offices do you want per capita? And you ran through some, some good stats just now. Uh, have you seen any communities use that to somehow drive their decision making on on how they want to how, how large or small a police force they want to have? So I, I want to point some of those figures I just gave you. By the way, are on a new police uh, new website by the Vera Institute of Justice um, called What Policing Costs, and you can see so many big cities across the country. And you know, Evan Evan got seventy four thousand, so. Um, you know, we're a lot smaller than some of these places. I think people are starting to have that conversation and they're starting to also understand that even within Evanston, both historically, you know, our neighborhoods are different in terms of where we police and how we police. And it's by design, uh, long design going back decades and the gender generations and 400 years actually. So the question then is, you know, how do we do that at this moment? And we're having these conversations about reparations in Evanston. It's happening in schools. So that similar parallel conversation happening in our neighborhoods in Evanston is kind of is kind of where we're going to go. But to answer your question, Mayor, um, it's where where cities are at right now. Mm -hmm. And and by the way, you know, you know, Chicago is going to have a billion dollar deficit. Cities across the country that have spent on COVID have to readjust and realign. And I think uh, I think everyone's having this conversation. But that's the, that's the only way. Evanston is not unique insofar as the majority of its police budget goes to personnel. That is actually true in almost all municipalities. Um, so, you know, we can cut some things around the edges, which again, might be necessary, or we can more efficiently use data resources 
So it's going to have to come back to a conversation about personnel. And, and I'm not going to pretend I know how to manage a city budget, let alone a, a department of, you know, 140 officers, 150 officers. But it, it is, uh, that's the core of the question around this, which means what are they doing and where are they and what do we want them to be doing? Uh, and there are, you know, one of the things that's very clear on the research, even around, um, you know, violent crime and gun violence is you can lower crime rates by making fewer arrests, right? So it's not uh, that you need to expand capacities, but that might mean investigation would look different or outreach efforts would look different. And so there are uh, best practices, again, some of which the chief mentioned, which are worth considering and seeing how they might offset other sorts of spending. Great, Th thank you, Professor. I think that um, we've got lots of questions and I wanna be respectful of people's times because we've, we've spoken for an hour already. I am going to um, set up another session in my police series uh, for us to, now that we've got a, a baseline on the, on the Evanston budget, uh, to really drive into some of the questions that I wasn't able to get to today that folks have, um, as well as talk, uh, in that session, I want to talk about what are our police responding to? Getting to your point, you know, what are people calling 911 with or 311 that is requiring the Evanston Police Department to respond? Um, and, and where are those calls coming from in our community? Um, and how do we set up deployments in our community with our police and, and, all, and all of that? Um, so uh, to sort of wrap up, I did have a question um, and I wanna to get to the ones that came in uh, online um, that uh, Brian asked, when does the budget go to the council for review and approval? It's a great, it's a great question. The timing of all this actually uh, for this kind of community conversation about policing is really good um, that we're having it right now and during, and during the summer, we'll continue to have it because it's in September that the city manager will roll out a budget for the 2021 period. And then we will go through a six to eight week process of community meetings and city council discussions on, the, on those budgets. I can tell you in the three years that I've been the mayor, we have never had anyone come to city council and say, you need to start spending less money on police. That hasn't, that hasn't happened. Um, we clearly this year are gonna take a deep look at our, our police budget um, and, and, and wanna make again, um, smart, sensible decisions that represent the community standards that we have here in Evanston and still make sure that people in our community are safe. It's very important uh, in terms of our fire department and our police department uh, that they um, are um, you know, funded in a way that makes sure that safety is, um, is there for all of us here in Evanston. Um, so that's, uh, so, so that Brian is, is how we'll do uh, the budget. We'll get a draft budget out in September and then we'll start to have city council meetings. That's an opportunity for the public as well to come to those meetings and speak during public comment about any thoughts or suggestions uh, that they, that they have. Um, I did have a, a question from Karen. I'm going to ask you this chief real quick. She asked, what is the annual turnover of the Evanston police department officers? Uh, we've been having it, it varies uh you know we got we we have a pretty young department now uh we just had a couple of uh commanders both had 30 years of service uh retired the department but uh it's usually two three sometimes four officers a year that'll go into retirement how about we had a question from tristan on how we can reduce or think about Evanston Police Department's overtime budget. Obviously, it's a lab, it's a labor cost, but can you just real quick uh, talk about how you think about overtime, Chief, and, and managing that? Yeah, you know, the city allocated nine hundred thousand uh, dollars for a number of years for overtime, but the actual overtime budget was one point five million. So, in order to cut that, what I did was. Uh, if we had units uh, working detectives, gangs, drugs, uh, juvenile officers working, if overtime 
came down and patrol, those officers would come down in uniform and work patrol for that day. Last year, we were able to save $135,000 by doing that. Uh, so we came in under the $1.5 million that they had been an average over the last three or four years down to $1.4 million. So uh, looking at, it's easy to get rid of overtime. You just say, hey, no overtime. And, and I'll do it. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's what people expect. It's what services. There are a lot of entities, the school districts, other other uh, city services drive our overtime. Training, you know, when I send an officer to train, if that, that, if that officer going to training takes us below minimum, I have to hire back. Uh, you know, so it's a lot of things uh, that we could do uh, and which we have been doing to minimize that overtime. Uh, and if I could add, I'd like yeah. to make an important point is, is that at least 50% of our overtime in 2019 was paid by other organizations, particularly Northwestern University, the CTA. So uh, we go to considerable efforts to make sure that they're billed and, and money received for overtime provided to Northwestern. CTA, the theaters, when we have officers on uh, those details, those organizations are paying for their time. Yeah, I appreciate you mentioning, mentioning that, Lou, because I get that question. I know our older men get that question. Um, so uh, we look to those outside organizations to pay, whether it's Northwestern or others. Uh, real quick, because uh, I want to be respectful of people that ask questions. I think many of these we got answered, but some that were not. Abigail had asked about uh, the militarization of police. We're going to talk about that in, in a different series, uh, or excuse me, a different session in our series of policing. Um, uh, uh, Fusha asked about um, uh, resource officers. Uh, we're going to talk about that at next week's uh, session on Monday. Um, uh, about reducing the size of the police force and all of that, that will be a conversation that the elected officials here in town and other people here in town are, are having. Uh, as the chief spoke today, we have a lot of, and made the decision of a lot of unfilled positions that were budgeted in 2020 have not been, have not been filled. Uh, again, part of that is really to address the deficit that we have as a result of the pandemic. Um, we talked about uh, what defunding the police means, uh, Jake and Liana had asked that question. Um, uh, schools, again, we'll talk about next week. Um, um, issues. Um, there was the question about, um, you know, mental health issues and all that. When we do that session that I just talked about, um, looking at the calls that the police are getting. Uh, in that session, we'll talk about the, the calls that they get to respond to, to mental health issues um, and have a conversation about that. Um, so yeah, and I think that, I think, I think we covered a lot of the questions uh, that, pe that folks had. Um, I know we didn't cover them all. Uh, like I said, this is a series of conversations. I will add additional topics uh, to this. So if you have any, please go ahead and just uh, put it into the Facebook feed that's being monitored by the city, or you could email me directly. Um, I want to thank the uh, police chief. Uh, I want to thank Lou Gerdes, our budget officer uh, for the Evanston Police Department. I want to thank uh, Professor Andrew Papakristos, uh, who is a uh, sociology professor at Northwestern, uh, who has looked at policing around around the country uh, for, join for joining us today. I particularly appreciated, Professor, the uh, how I think um, concisely you raised the issues that we're going to have to address here in Evanston. So I appreciate appreciate that. Uh, I also appreciate uh, Patrick Degnan and Anderson Castillo, who are behind the scenes but help us put this on for the community. So we'll continue to do that. The next policing uh, 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 discussion will be next Monday, July 20th at uh, 12 o'clock, and that one will be on uh, the uh, coordination and collaboration uh, that goes on between Evanston Police Department, our uh, schools, District 202 and 65, as well as Northwestern University. 
So until then, be well, everyone. Thank you for tuning in and thank you for uh, being a part of this conversation in our community. Good night. Yes, sir. Thank yeah, you. Thank you.